We shall move to questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? And give the call to the honourable member for Hume. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, it's hard to follow from what we've just heard, but my question is to the Treasurer. Since the election, the adult population has increased by over a million people. Meanwhile, home building completions are around a quarter of that. We are in a GDP per capita or family recession. The only thing left driving the economy is migration at a time when Labor's housing crisis is worsening. Why is this government taking our economy in the wrong direction? A call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Shadow question, uh, Treasurer for his question. Uh, we're not. Uh, and uh, for evidence of that, uh, have a look at the quite remarkable jobs numbers that we got uh, a couple of hours ago. We've got uh, unemployment falling, we've got real wages growing, we've got inflation moderating. Uh, in each of those three respects, the economy is in a stronger position uh, than what we inherited in May of 2022. Now, when it comes to uh, the migration numbers that the Shadow Treasurer asked about, and indeed the housing situation that the Shadow Treasurer asked about as well, uh, we did get today uh, more data uh, about net overseas migration. The reason why that number was uh, relatively high was because of the arrival of international students. Uh, and what today's data doesn't take into account uh, is the quite substantial action uh, that the ministers uh, and the government have taken when it comes to putting downward pressure on this net overseas migration. A number of these actions uh, were implemented in the second half of last year uh, and therefore not yet uh, accurately captured in the new data uh, that we have today. Uh, indeed, from this weekend, uh, there are new steps to tighten up uh, some of the program uh, to make sure that we crack down on the highest risk providers in the education system. We're introducing a new genuine student test. Uh, and this is on top of other actions that we've taken, closing the COVID scheme, strengthening integrity, uh, tackling exploitation, uh, targeting skilled migration to genuine shortages. Uh, increasing the minimum wage threshold for skilled migrants after that was frozen by those opposite for nearly a decade. Uh, so we're taking action when it comes to net overseas migration, but we recognise that it is largely a story about students uh, and the strength of our university sector. Uh, when it comes to housing, uh, and I, I want to say this in a respectful way that reflects the respectful way that the Shadow Treasurer answered the question in the context today uh, of uh, the uh, speeches that were given a moment ago. Uh, when it comes to housing, if those opposite uh, wanted were serious about the housing shortage in this country, they'd vote to help fix it. Uh, and we have proposed, and again, tribute to the housing minister and the cabinet prime minister, uh, we've got about 17 different housing policies, and they've not all been supported by those opposite. And so, if those opposite were serious about housing, there is a shortage of housing in this country, and we're doing our best to address that and alleviate that, and if they were serious about it, they'd help us. Yeah. Give a call to the honourable member for Paterson. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. How is the Albanese Labor government progressing our defence cooperation with the United Kingdom to keep all Australians safe? Call to the D D Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I welcome the Right Honourable Grant Shapps, the UK Defence Secretary. Yeah. It is a pleasure to have him here uh, during question time. I can say that I've uh, spoken with the opposition, uh, and uh, collectively we've agreed that over the course of the next hour, our behaviour will represent the high watermark of uh, Australia's <laughs> democracy. This morning. Uh, Secretary Shapps and I signed the Defence and Security Cooperation Agreement between Australia and the United Kingdom, which is a status of forces agreement between our two countries, and it contains a commitment to consult with each other when there are contingencies which engage our national security and our sovereignty. It is a historic agreement. Britain is our oldest relationship 
and our oldest friend. We have long had deep people-to-people -people ties. We have long had a deep cultural relationship. And so it is somewhat of a surprise that it is only now that we are signing a status of forces agreement. And yet it reflects the fact that over the last couple of years we have seen emerge a strategic and security dimension to this relationship. Britain is increasing its presence in the Indo-Pacific and today there are Australian servicemen and women in the UK training Ukrainian armed forces. Our two defence forces are working ever closely together and so this agreement is both practical and timely. And this afternoon the two of us will join Foreign Minister Senator Penny Wong and Foreign Secretary David Cameron to participate in the annual 2 plus 2 Orkmin dialogue uh, between our two countries. This will be happening in Adelaide, which will afford us all an opportunity to visit the Osborne Naval Shipyard, where, under the banner of AUKUS, which is very much at the heart of our relationship, Australia will be establishing a production line to build our future nuclear-powered submarines with the assistance of the United Kingdom and the United States. And the submarines that we produce there, that class of submarines, will be jointly operated by Australia and the UK, and there is no greater statement than this of the significance of the security dimension of the Australia-UK relationship. Can I say to Grant, I am deeply grateful for our personal friendship, and that, along with the friendship of so many Aussies and Brits, is emblematic of the bilateral relationship which exists between our two countries. And can I say that we look forward in a difficult world to walking into the future side by side, making our contribution to global peace and security. Yeah. On indulgence, the member for Canning. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I join the Deputy Prime Minister in welcoming uh, Defence Secretary Shapps and also High Commissioner Smith. It's great to have you here today. And can I associate our, uh, this side of the House with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister's comments? Uh, on the UK-Australia relationship, we are of one mind, uh, and so we welcome this Status of Forces agreement and also deepening our country's ties, specifically through AUKUS. And so I look forward to hearing more of your planned meetings, and uh, we, we will be there all the way with you. Thank you. We call to the member for Deakin. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In the year, year ending 30 September 2023, net overseas migration was 548,800 people, which is an increase of 206,000 500 or a 60 per cent increase from the previous year. Prime Minister, don't these figures just confirm that Labor's housing crisis is worsening, with overseas arrivals now running at four times the rate of new home builds? Call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. I, I join with uh, the members of parliament in welcoming uh, our UK minister here. I look forward to welcoming uh, Minister Shapps to uh, the lodge later today, along with uh, Minister Cameron, the foreign minister, will be hosting the Ockmin delegation there uh, this evening uh, before they head to Adelaide for what will be a very important meeting. And I look forward to, uh, to hearing the feedback about your trip to Osborne. And uh, I was able to uh, indeed host the High Commissioner uh, just uh, on Tuesday evening as well to get a briefing about the relationship between Australia and the UK, of which the AUKUS arrangements in our defence relationship is so important. Um, on the question, Mr Speaker, um, the fact is that migration is lower than it was anticipated to be. The population figures lower than what was anticipated Order. to be under Order. the former under the former government. The member for Deakin and has indeed, asked his question. The Business Council of Australia have uh, said, in fact, uh, new housing supply has been falling over the last half decade. They said that in 2023, 
about the period in which those opposite were in government. Not the ACTU, the Business Council of Australia. I know that they're anti-business a lot of the time these days. The modern Liberal Party have just kept moving further and further and further to the right. So they're the Order. party now led by people like Senator Antich and others, uh, rather than mainstream, rather yeah. than mainstream people. The uh, member uh, Mr. for Deakin will The member for Deakin's faction are running that, that, uh, that mob in Melbourne into, into the ground, Mr Speaker, into the ground. Order. The member for Deakin will leave the chamber under 94A. When I'm giving someone the call, that is not the time to add an insult to somebody. Trust me. The member for one is entitled to raise a point of order, and he should be heard in silence, and no interjections will occur while I hear this point of order. The member for one on a point of Thanks, order. Thanks, Speaker. And it goes to relevance, and you can't shake it off. Arrivals the, are running the, at four the, times the rate. Seat. Resume your seat. The Minister for Home Affairs. The Prime Minister was asked a question about migration. He's giving exact context about the figures with migration. I don't see him, it's virtually impossible to raise a point of order on relevance when he's directly answering the question which he was asked about, particularly on immigration. And now he's talking about housing. We simply aren't going to have people getting up and taking points of order because they don't like the answer. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I quoted the peak organisation, but I'll quote another senior businesswoman, uh, Susan Lloyd Hurwitz, the former head of Mervac, knows something about housing, uh, the chair of the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council, who said this housing and rental affordability is a real problem which has been decades in the making, fundamentally a housing supply issue. Now, the nation's housing ministers under the former government did not meet over five years. No meetings. None. None. By the end of their nine years in office, at the end of the June quarter 2022, Order. the number of the private dwellings completed had fallen to 41,000, the lowest quarterly number since 2014. The lowest. And the person who just got dismissed from the chamber had this to say. States and territories have the primary responsibility. There's a lot of work to be done by state Order, and territories. The time he was the federal minister. Concluded. Couldn't he? To the call to the honourable member for Macquarie. Questions to the Treasurer. What are today's jobs figures and what do they mean for the Albanese Labor government's economic strategy? What approaches have been rejected? Give the call. To the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for Macquarie for her great work and for her great question. The jobs numbers today were absolutely remarkable. 116,000 new jobs were created in the month of February. 790,000 jobs have been created under Order. this Prime Minister and his government. That is another new record for a first term government. The unemployment rate fell substantially from 4.1 per cent to 3.7 per cent. What an amazing tribute to our workers, our employers and to the resilience of our labour market. Inflation is the lowest in two years. Unemployment is the lowest in six months. Real wages are growing ahead of shed of schedule and we get tax cuts flowing from the 1st of July. This means more people are working. More people are earning more, and more people will be keeping more of what they earn as well. This is the trifecta, Mr Speaker. Unemployment falling, inflation moderating, real wages growing again in our economy. Despite a slowing economy, despite all of the pressures that people are under, despite everything which is coming at us from around the world, we have faster jobs growth than any major advanced economy. We have workforce participation higher than any major advanced economy. Average unemployment under this Prime Minister 3.7 per cent compared with 5.6 per cent under those opposite. So unemployment is now lower than when we came to office. Quarterly inflation is much lower than when we came to office and real wages growth is much higher than it was when we came to office, Mr Speaker. We are managing our economy in a responsible and methodical way, and as a consequence of that, 
we're making welcome and encouraging pro progress. And here the contrast couldn't be clearer, Mr Speaker. Almost two years in, we don't know what their economic plan is. We don't know what their alternative policies are on the cost of living, but we do know they want people working longer for less. We do know they voted for higher inflation and lower wages. We do know the Deputy Order. Leader said they roll back our tax cuts. And we do know all about the economic insanity of their uncosted nuclear fantasy, Mr Speaker. And we know from reports today, we also know that when the opposition leader was invited to the Business Council of Australia annual event to give his vision for the economy, the sum total of that vision was to tell business, to beg business, that they had to bag Labor more, uh, Mr Speaker, and that says it all. They have no ideas, no alternatives and no credibility, and that's why nobody takes them seriously on the economy. Now, we still expect the labour market to soften, Mr Speaker. We've been upfront about that. But we have seen more jobs created, Order. we've seen inflation moderating, we've seen real wages growing. That does mean more people are working, more people are earning more, more people will keep more of what they earn. And the jobs number we got Treasures today, which was remarkable, is an concluded. important part. The order, before I call the member for Ryan, I'd just like to do some acknowledgements. I'm pleased to inform the House that present in the gallery today are participants in the National Schools Constitutional Convention and also representatives from Meals on Wheels Australia who are celebrating their 70th anniversary alongside the parliamentary friends of Meals on Wheels, ably led by the members for Adelaide and the members for Park. Welcome to you all. We give the call to the honourable member for Ryan. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Unlike you and I did, today's students don't enjoy free university, and students across the country are struggling with the cost of living crisis. Student debt is rising faster than it can be paid off. Student debt should be wiped. Prime Minister, will you abolish indexation on student debt or offer any other student debt relief in the May budget? Yeah. Call to the Minister for Education. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the member for her question? Um, and recognise the interest of a number of members of the crossbench who have raised the question about reform to HEX or what we no now call HELP. Uh, also recognise uh, that the issue has been raised with me by a number of members of the government as well. I have met with a member for Jagger Jagger about this very issue yesterday, uh, as well as the member for Chisholm, I think the member for Cunningham, the member for McNamara and the member for Benelong have raised this with me as well. It's why I asked the Accord team to look at this very issue as part of their review of our higher education system. A couple of weeks ago I released the University's Accord final report. It's a blueprint for higher education reform for the next decade and the one after that. And it includes recommendations in it about how we make our HEC system fairer and simpler. Uh, we're looking at all of the recommendations in that report at the moment including the recommendations around HEX, and will respond to the first stage of our reforms responding to that report in the next few months. Give the call to the member for Fraser. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. What has been the response to the Albanese Labor government's workplace relations reforms, which have helped Australians earn more and keep more of what they earn? It's called to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and the Minister for the Arts. Thanks very much, Speaker. And I thank the member for Fraser uh, for the question uh, and appreciated the opportunity to be with him in his electorate only a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at some of the jobs programs that we've got there. Uh, because the first response that comes to uh, workplace relations policies is actually what's the response happening on the ground. Because we were told the response was going to be a huge increase in unemployment. That's what we were told was going to happen. And now the results are in. The results are in. Unemployment down to 3.7 per cent. 116,000 new jobs. 790,000 new jobs under this Prime Minister. That's 790,000 people in a job Order. who weren't. 790,000 people who are now earning more the and keeping more the, of what they the earn under the policies of the, house of the Albanese. This yelling across the chamber is not going to continue. The Treasurer and the Shadow Treasurer, trust me, can take their conversation outside. They will not continue that sort of behaviour. And 
the noise is far too great. Just telling everyone it's far too loud. The yelling's got to stop. There'll be no more yelling today, or there'll be actions. The minister will continue. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, and so, in those figures, wages are up, inflation is down. Jobs are up, unemployment is down. And it's in no small part because the theory that we were told that if you pay people more, they'll all lose their jobs was simply not true. It was just another excuse to try to argue for low wages. And so we had, but the shouting that happened earlier in the question wasn't the only anger that's happened, because the Business Council were the ones who copped it last night, we're told. In the, in the speech from the Leader of the Opposition, it was a Business Council he was angry with, because business wasn't being angry with him at this government. And the, the complaint that, and the complaint that business wasn't, being, wasn't making the complaints that he wanted. So I went back and thought, well, when was the last time the Leader of the Opposition actually led the complaints in the parliament on the issue? When did he actually ask a question or his party ask a question about workplace relations? And it would be unfair to say they've asked me none, because they did ask one on September 2022. <laughs> Now, since that time, it's not like the government's done much in workplace relations. Like, except for the closing loopholes bill, except for the protecting of working, worker entitlements bill, except for closing loopholes number one and closing loopholes number two, absolutely nothing's been done. But in all of that, not one question. And yet they have the audacity to get angry with businesses saying, well, why aren't you doing it? The Leader of the Opposition is making the shadow treasurer look busy in the way he's working here. And so what we have is them not wanting to be upfront about what they are targeting, because we do know they have a targeted package of repeals that they want to take to the next election that they're not willing to talk about publicly in this parliament. Targeted against higher wages, targeted against job security, targeted against closing the gender pay gap, targeted against Australian workers. A call to the honourable member for Hume. My question is to the Prime Minister. Isn't the true story behind today's data that people are working harder for longer because they can't afford to pay their bills under this government's disastrous economic policy? I give the call to the Prime Minister. Well, I, I thank the uh, Shadow Treasurer for his question. Um, we have an extraordinary circumstance where we have uh, the premise of that question completely counter to uh, what the data today is actually showing. Because the data today shows a drop in unemployment from 4.1 down to 3.7 per cent. The data today finds uh, that the, the, the previous more than 100,000 jobs created. In one month, more than 100,000 jobs being created. And order, order. They, they get angry when you talk about jobs being created, Mr. Speaker. Order. It makes them so angry that unemployment has gone down and that wages growth is double what it was, with real wages increasing. So what we, have, what we have is real wages increasing, inflation moderating, unemployment heading down, productivity going up, a $78 billion surplus being, uh, deficit being replaced by a $22 billion surplus. A government that is responding and fiscal policy working with monetary policy, not against it. And it stands in stark contrast to the circumstances that we inherited, with real wages going backwards, with inflation peaking at 2.1 per cent in the March 2022 quarter, with real wages going backwards with jobs not being created like the numbers that we've seen in today's data, with reform 
that assist people as well, working people, including uh, half the population, by the way, are women, that they forgot. So the gender pay gap at its lowest level in history of 12 per cent. Paid parental leave being extended, passed through the Senate on Monday. You have super guarantee now being paid, will be paid on paid parental leave. We'll wait and see uh, whether they support or oppose that. They sort of opposed it for an hour. It was a bit like tax. And tax cuts going to every single taxpayer on July 1, so people can keep more of what they are earning. The call to the honourable member for Hawke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care. How is the Albanese Labor government helping aged care workers earn more and keep more of what they earn? What impact is the government's policies having on improving the standard of aged care in Australia? What has been the response? Call to the Minister for Aged Care and Sport. Um, I thank the member for Hawke for his question. Workers are both the beating heart and the backbone of Australia's aged care system. And that is why, from our very first day in government, we have been focused on ensuring there are more carers with more time to care, focused on putting the nurses back into nursing homes, focused on making sure that these amazing and dedicated workers are properly valued for the crucial and skilled work that they perform. That's why we backed aged care workers in their fight for better wages at the Fair Work Commission. Mm -hmm. And we delivered a 15 per cent increase to award wage minimums for 250,000 workers, an $11.3 billion investment in the people who dedicate their working lives to caring for older Australians. Mm -hmm. That increase is changing the lives of both the workers and the people that they care for. I recently met with aged care workers and they told me about their colleague named Kylie. Kylie is a single mum living, working and raising her family in Penrith in the member for Lindsay's electorate. And before the 15 per cent increase in the award wage minimum, Kylie was trying to get approved for a mortgage in order to buy a house for her and her kids. But the banks wouldn't lend to her because despite doing this incredibly valuable work, she wasn't paid enough. But under the Albanese Labor government, that changed. And after the pay increase on 1 July last year, Kylie has now been approved for a mortgage and able to buy an apartment for the very first time. How amazing is that? But our investment in workers, like Kylie, are not just paying dividends for her and her family, but also for the people that they care for. And under the Albanese government, older people are receiving an additional 2.16 minutes of care every single day. We are seeing improvements in their star ratings data with fewer one and two star rated facilities now and more and five star rated facilities. But we don't just want er workers to earn more, we want them to keep more of what they earn. Mm -hmm. And from 1 July, every single taxpayer, including our aged care workers, will receive a tax cut. So not only can a personal care worker like Kylie take home $7,300 more every single year, they will now get a tax cut of more than $1,100 under Labor's tax cuts, almost double what they would have got from the coalition. And Mr Speaker, with my remaining time, can I give a shout out to the students from the National Schools Constitutional Convention that we have here with us this afternoon, particularly to Sophie from Aspley. Um, who promised this me she's going to give rebuttal a go, and she definitely has to now. I've shouted her out in the federal parliament for it. And as she can see from the standard we display here, it's really not that hard. <laughs> Best of luck, Kylie. Give the call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Minister for Immigration. Order. Members on my right. The Deputy Leader has the call. My question is to the Minister for Immigration. One of the hardcore criminals the Albanese government released from immigration detention has been revealed as a 42-year-old Cuban man previously convicted and jailed for raping a teenager. The Australian has reported that the Minister this week removed the requirement for this rapist to wear an ankle bracelet. How many convicted rapists released by the Minister are not required to wear an ankle monitor? Call to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. 
Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her question. I remind her and I remind the House that this results from a decision of the High Court, a decision which we strongly argued against. But like any government, we have to abide by the decisions of the court. In response to that, we put in place a range of measures to secure the powers and also the resources our law enforcement uh, agencies require to keep the community safe. As the ABF Commissioner said the other day, and I quote, the ABF stands ready to adapt to deliver the best outcomes for the community. And a big part of that was, of course, putting in place a community protection board of expert law enforcement officials to advise on the mechanisms that are available. Their expert advice means that we have the skills and information to manage these cases appropriately. These are decisions that are endorsed by the ABF the, Commissioner, and the we respect will their pause. advice. Has the minister completed his answer? No. The order, the member for Holt. Has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Why is reform of, ad of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal so vital? Call to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Holt for her question. It's an important question. As everyone in this place is aware, under the former government, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal became dysfunctional order with the, enormous order backlogs. The General pause. We are ten seconds into the answer. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I'm just going to ask her to cease interjecting so I can hear the answer to this question. The Attorney General has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As everyone in this place is aware, under the former government the Administrative Appeals Tribunal became dysfunctional with enormous backlogs causing delays of many months and, in some areas, even years. Through active stacking and willful neglect, the former government left the AAT to rot and Australians suffered as a result. The people affected by these delays are among our most vulnerable people relying on Centrelink, NDIS clients and veterans. I'm pleased the legislation to abolish the AAT and replace it with a new administrative review body that is user-focused, efficient, accessible, independent and fair past this place today. I'm grateful to my friend the member for Macquarie for the excellent work of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, which she chairs, for its thorough consultations and thoughtful report. That committee unanimously recommended that the bill pass this place. I'd also like to thank Senator Anita Green as the chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs and thank the, her committee for its work on this important legislation. This is vital reform that will have a lasting benefit, a real benefit for the lives of thousands of Australians, Australians who sadly were abandoned by the former government. I've had productive conversations across the parliament with those who understand the value of these reforms and the importance of delivering on the new tribunal as a priority. Australians are relying on us to get on with the job of establishing the new administrative review tribunal. We know the Liberal Party wants to delay these reforms as long as possible. It's about protecting their stack. All their Liberal mates appointed without any merit-based process, just a call from the Minister's office. We call to the member for Hume. Hey, Mr Speaker, I, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's previous answer, telling Australians that they have never had it so good. Prime Minister, isn't it the case that unemployment? Just resume your seat for a moment. We'll get back to your question. The Treasurer will cease interjecting. The, well, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't need to assist me before I call someone. Prime Minister is rising on a point of order. What? The point Prime Minister has the call. Is you in charge? Or? Order. The Leader of the Opposition will just remain silent. Just as I. Order. 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 When the Leader of the Opposition takes a point of order, I ask everyone to be silent. I'm doing the same for the Prime Minister. 
Prime Minister is raising on a point of order. I want to hear what the point of order is. Mr. Speaker, it goes to the standing orders that require uh, the verbling that just occurred of quoting, of quoting former Prime Minister John Howard, not myself. We have very little in common, Mr. Speaker, and that comment is not one of them. Order. Order. The just going to say if the shadow treasurer is claiming that, that someone has said something, he's got to make sure it's accurate, not what he thinks he was said or what the record shows. That's what I'm trying to say. The, we'll just we'll start again and we'll ask the shadow treasurer to begin his question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's previous answer telling Australians that they've never had it better. Uh, Prime Minister, isn't it the case that unemployment today reflects Australians scrambling for extra work to pay their bills under this government's disastrous economic policies? Order. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I note the change in language between the first attempted question and the second, but neither of them, neither of them, of course, were accurate. Neither of them, of course, were accurate. But this is what the figures released today actually show, Mr. Speaker, that the unemployment order, the shadow treasurer. Has had a really good go today. <laughs> so he's just going to remain silent for the remainder of this answer and every other answer to assist the House. The Prime Minister he, he, has. He the has call. had unusually for the shadow treasurer it's a good crack to today. <laughs> a good crack today. But unfortunately, they handed the questions from the member for Deakin to him, <laughs> and before he read them, he just read them out loud. I'll give you a tip, mate. Read them first. Decide how silly they are. Order. Now the unemployment rate today went down from 4.1 to 3.7. They think that's bad. Yeah, exactly. They think that's bad. Who here thinks that that was good? <laughs> the unemployment rate at the election Order. in May 22 Order. was 4%. Order. No, the prime minister will pause. The members on my left. Members on my left will cease the ejecting. The member for Groom and the member for Page will cease the ejecting, and the member for Barker will cease the ejecting. The Prime Minister will be heard. They hate it. Total Order. employment increased by 116,500 in a month. We think that's good. They think it's bad. The total employment increased by 437,000 over the year. We think that's good. They think that's bad. The participation rate increased. And, and not every state, not Order. every state has an unemployment rate with a, with a three in front of it. I'll say that. Not every state, not every state. Didn't happen when they were in government, but nationally, of course, it's happened uh, most months. Except for there was one; it dipped up to 4.1, but it's back with a three. See if you can guess what these, these states have in common that have a unemployment rate with a three in front. New South Wales, 3.6. Premier Mintz. Victoria, 3.9. Premier Allen. Queensland, 3.9. South Australia 3.2, Premier Miles. South Australia, Order. Premier Mally 3.2, WA 3.6. Order. The only state, there's five states in Australia with Labor governments. All of them have an unemployment rate with a three in front. They have something in common, which is that Labor governments believe in creating jobs. <laughs> Call to the member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, representing the Minister for Women. Why is it important to have women in the room where decisions are made? 
And what are the consequences when women are not? I call to the minister representing the Minister for Women. Thank you very much. And can I thank very much the member for Boothby for what is a really important question to reflect on just how important it is to have women in the room where decisions are being made. And of course, the, this government is very deeply focused on delivering for women. We want to make sure that happens right the way across the economy, increasing women's economic participation. We want to make sure women have greater opportunities for, to participate in the economic and social life of this country. And of course, that doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't just happen. We are the first federal government to have a party room with women in the majority. And of course, today, uh, this week, we welcomed a new woman into our ranks, the fabulous member for Dunkley, who has spent all of her working life championing some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged women in the Dunkley community. And it is so fabulous to have, us here, have her here. Having women in the room matters, and it matters in the way in which you make policies. It's why I'm so part proud to be part of a government that has been concentrating on improving access to childcare, making sure that childcare is affordable, because it's not just about economic, it's not just about importance of education for children, it is also a good economic policy. It's also why I'm so proud that we not only introduce paid parental leave, but that we have increased paid parental leave this week, as well as extending superannuation to paid parental leave, which will be absolutely critical for the retirement incomes of women. But it does stand, I'd have to say, in contrast with those opposite. Having women in the room matters. Having women on this side of the House absolutely has mattered when it comes to policy. And it's why we've seen in recent days those opposite knock off their most senior the woman Deputy in Leader South Australia opposition. for their Senate ticket in favour of a man who is a COVID conspiracist and thinks and, frankly, is also a Putin apologist. No wonder they are backing Russia on fuel efficiency standards, frankly. They have refused to pre-select a woman for the seat of Cook. They refuse to select pre-select a woman for the seat of Fadden. I'm not sure I've lost track of what's happening McPherson. in the pre-selection in McPherson, and I admire very much. I've got a ter terrific woman over there uh, in the member for McPherson now, someone who is a good friend of mine. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what's happening there, but so far I don't think any women have put their hands up. But we've also saw that in pre-select a woman in Dunkley either. Now, really, actions like that actually matter. They matter for the decisions that are made around the cabinet table. They ma matter in Order. terms of the decisions that are made around the party room. I am very proud to be part of a government that is promoting the economic and social interests of women. Those opposite have got a lot to learn. Give the call to the honourable member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. Minister, last year you expanded the water trigger in our national environment law, so all forms of unconventional gas were covered by it. Gas company Tambaran has approval from the Northern Territory Government to start gas fracking in the Beedaloo Basin. The new water trigger very likely applies to that project, but Tambaran has not referred it to you for assessment. Minister, why haven't you used your powers to call in the Tambaran project for assessment? Thank you. I give a call to the Minister for the Environment and Water. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for McKellar for her question. Uh, she has been a very long-term advocate for better environmental protections, and she did an enormous amount of work on the uh, issue of strengthening the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act to broaden the water trigger to all forms of unconventional gas. And I thank her for her support of the government's first tranche of changes to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which passed this parliament at the end of last year, including the water trigger, but also, of course, establishing the nature repair market. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, of course, as a potential decision maker, I'm not able to comment on any individual matters that may come before me, but I want to reassure the member for McKellar that the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water wrote to all known companies that have 
activities in the Beedaloo Basin, including Tamburin Resources, to inform them of their new obligations uh, that may apply to any operations they have under the water trigger uh, amendments. Um, uh, I haven't received any referral for the activities uh, of any of those companies in the Beedaloo Basin. As a potential decision maker, as I say, it's not appropriate for me to offer commentary on any particular project. Uh, but because uh, the member for McKellar and a number of uh, members on this side have raised concerns, I have asked my department to provide advice to me to assure me that all companies that are operating in the Beedaloo Basin are complying with their obligations under the expanded water trigger. Call to the member for Chisholm. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In light of the Chinese Foreign Minister's visit to Australia, what progress has been made in stabilising the relationship between our two countries? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Chisholm, uh, who understands that it's not just a matter of our relationship with the world and our place in the world. It's also because we're a multicultural nation about our cohesiveness as a society here. But the world is, of course, confronting serious challenges and economic headwinds. And what happens internationally does matter at home. Uh, we know that one in four jobs in Australia is trade dependent. And this government has made it a priority for Australia to take our seat at the table, to speak out for our interests, to shape decisions, not just respond to them. It's how we get results for Australians, for jobs, for trade, for our economy, but also for our national security. We recently hosted all of the ASEAN leaders in Melbourne. We brought them together, uh, people from across our region, to promote prosperity, stability and security. And the speech by President Marcos here, I think, was a very important one uh, that he gave, following on from the speech from Prime Minister Marape. Uh, we, last year, I was pleased to be the first Australian PM to visit China since 2016. Yeah, yeah. We know this is one of our most important relationships, and yesterday it was good to meet Foreign Minister Wang Yi following his official meetings with Foreign Minister Wong. It has been a constructive visit to Australia discussing stabilisation of our relationship and follow-up from my visit to China. Uh, in particular, the removal of trade impediments has been a big plus for Australian agriculture, for Australian resources, for Australian jobs. And we look forward to the interim decision on wine carrying through to a decision which will mean substantial job creation in Hun Valley, in uh, the South Australian wine wineries, in right throughout Australia. Uh, our, our approach has been patient, it's been calibrated and it's been deliberate. It's a mature and responsible approach that has stabilised the relationship without compromising any of our core interests. I've said we'll cooperate where we can, we'll disagree where we must, but we'll engage in our national interest, mm -hmm. and it is paying dividends. Uh, Minister Wang Yi's visit gave us an opportunity to reinforce our views as well about maritime security issues and other consular uh, cases that are of concern. I'm pleased that Premier Lee has accepted my invitation for our leaders' meeting to occur uh, in coming months here in Australia. Consistent dialogue is crucial. We'll continue to engage in that patient, deliberate and calibrated matter that has defined and characterised the way that we've responded to these issues. And on that note, uh, Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.